Right. So good afternoon to everyone and good morning. Good evening. Happy tea time and coffee time to our viewers tuning in our YouTube channel in their free time. So welcome to the Innovations in Aging Research Webinar Series. I am your host, Noemi Lansang from the Philippines and just shameless plugging. My research interests are in complementary medicine. It's focusing on martial arts, dance, and sound therapy. All right, so just a few advertisements before we do start. Um, let's start with this webinar is brought to you by ACRM's Aging Research and Geriatric Rehabilitation Networking Group. We are welcoming new members, so if anyone's interested to build up your aging research and geriatric research, please check out our webpage flashed on your screens and try to join monthly meetings and see what we're up to. Or you can send an email to our chairperson, Dr. Amit Kumar. His email is also flashed on your screen. And calling all enthusiasts in May, there will be a ACRM spring meeting. It will be in Atlanta from May 11th to May 13th. Please check out the website, acrm.org to see the rates and if there's still you know, a way to you to go to Atlanta. And then this year is the 100th, 100th annual conference in October to November 2. So please mark your calendars, check the rates, size up your schedules, prepare your wallet, and see you in Atlanta this um, October to November. There is still calling for proposals, so you can catch the wave and submit some to them. Okay, so that's it for advertisements. For this afternoon, we have with us Dr. Jason Falvey and Dr. Jennifer Brack, who will be speaking on from claims to community, investigating in inequities in rehabilitation, utilization, and outcomes among older adults living with a new disability. So I do want to advise everyone that this meeting is being recorded. So all attendees, please keep your phones and microphones muted and keep your cameras turned off throughout the presentation. We do expect around 20 minutes to, um, for discussion at the end of the webinar. So if you have questions, please type them in the chat feature and we will address as many as we can during that time. Okay. All right, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest today. Our first speaker is Dr. Jason Falvey. He is a physical therapist and a clinician scientist with expertise using Medicare claims and national survey data to evaluate functional recovery. Sorry. Uh, aging in place, and healthcare utilization among older adults recovering from acute hospitalization. He is the second physical therapist to be funded by a Paul B. Beeson Emerging Leaders Career Development Award, K76, from the National Institute on Aging. His research on economic and social disparities in health outcomes among older adults has recently been published in high-impact journals, and his clinical and research ex expertise has been featured in news outlets such as the Washington Post. So Dr. Falvey is a board-certified clinical specialist in geriatric physical therapy with years of experience in home health care settings. He is an active clinical practitioner at the Baltimore Veterans Administration Hospital and an assistant professor in the University of Maryland School of Medicine, Department of Epidemiology and Public Health. For our second speaker today, we have Dr. Jennifer Brack. She is a physical therapist and epidemiologist with over 20 years of experience in patient-oriented research in aging and disability prevention. Dr. Brack's current work focuses on developing, testing, and implementing exercise exercise programs to improve mobility in community dwelling older adults. And her long-term goal is to bridge the gap between clinical research 
public health and everyday practice by transferring the findings from clinical trials to practice settings and communities. She has demonstrated a strong commitment to a career in research, publishing over 130 peer-reviewed manuscripts. She was the first non-physician to receive the prestigious Paul Beeson Development Award in Aging from the National Institute on Aging. Dr. Brack has also served as a principal investigator or co-investigator on multiple NIA and PCORI grants. She is currently a member of the leadership core of the Clinician Scientist Transdisciplinary Aging Research or ClinStar Coordinating Center. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we have Dr. Falvi and Dr. Brack. There you go. Thank you for being here. So Dr. Valvi, I'll give you the floor. I'll stop sharing now and give you the floor. Okay. So can you guys see my screen? All good? Yes, yes, we do. Okay. Good. Well, I appreciate uh, that great introduction, and I'm glad to be here for those of you who are live and those of you who might watch this recording. Um, but I'm going to get right into it. So for the sake of time here, we're going to talk a little bit about inequities and in rehab use and outcomes. So we're going to take a little bit of a different look from more of a population health standpoint about how older adults with a new disability um, can access the services they need and improve recovery and outcomes that they actually care about, the, the really the patient-centered outcomes. So I'm going to start by just, you know, describing funding um, and no other disclosures. And so I frame a lot of the talks that I start with this concept of aging in place. And I like to think about it a little bit more specifically than the, the contemporary views, which are if you're alive and living at home instead of a nursing home, you are successfully aging in place. And I think that's maybe a little bit of an incomplete description. And I think it's a little problematic because older adults often wanna have unrestricted participation in social activities, many of which occur outside the home. So if you're just being able to, to stay at home and you know live there, but not be in a hospital or nursing home, but you can't do anything fun outside of your home, I wouldn't consider that high quality aging in place. You need both of those things together to really make this concept a reality. And as therapists, we're pretty good at thinking about this. Um, home but homebound is not good enough is the mantra, you know, one of many mantras I have in my life, but my prior life as a home care physical therapist, I certainly said this to patients quite a bit that just the fact that they were home was an important step, but it wasn't the outcomes that we were really going to stop at. And this has a couple of components. Strength and walking ability, which we're really good at measuring as therapists and paying attention to and addressing. But economic barriers and social determinants of health are other factors that we maybe don't pay as much attention to. Um, and they really do provide a, a substantial barrier to high quality aging in place. So, I guess we're going to repeat that. Um, community mobility as a marker of high quality aging in place. So one way we can think about this concept of high quality aging in place is how well people are getting out in the community, how much help they need, and how frequently they're able to do it. And we can generally separate people into non-community or community level ambulators using this kind of life space concept. That's an important distinction because most older adults uh, their favorite activities aren't knitting and mahjong like many um, you know, cultural parodies might make them, you know, make you seem to think, but they want to be outside, walking, jogging, doing things outdoors, playing sports, playing catch with their grandkids. These are high demand activities that we often maybe don't prioritize as much during rehabilitation. And adding to that is like community mobility demands of older adults. Um, we think about the things that older adults would have to do to be independent on a daily basis. And things like going to the doctor, going to the pharmacy, visiting religious facilities, and God knows going to a hospital to visit a loved one by the time you park in a parking garage and get to a hospital room, it can be, you know, some research has suggested up to 749 meters. 
Um, compare that to the 150 foot goal, which gets you the maximal ambulation score in US based post acute care facilities like nursing homes and in home health care, which is often used as the discharge criteria. These things don't necessarily match up. So, our rehab goals in general don't really push people towards community mobility. And it's particularly concerning because recovery of community mobility is not equitable after disabling hospitalizations. And the demands that people have for community mo mobility concerningly are much higher for people um, with more social vulnerability, such as living in disadvantaged neighborhoods. And it can drive, you know, th this can be driven across multiple factors. So there's racial and ethnic identity, poverty, transportation, built environment, access to healthcare. Those can all drive inequities in community mobility. We're gonna talk a little bit about some research I've done um, and, and work my team has done in these areas. So one of the areas of investigation that we think is more novel and really speaks to this idea of interdisciplinary expertise is looking at claims data to think about poverty, you know, a social determinant of health and how that's impacting aging in place. So melding together the social sciences, economics, and geriatrics. And we've able, we're able to use from our, our health services expertise on our team to build this metric of days at home, understanding aging in place from um, a claims-based perspective. And we think this is a really important patient-centered outcome as well. It's hard to argue that patients would not rather be at home than in a facility. And spending more days at home is associated with higher function and quality of life. And the advantage of this is it allows you to get some baseline free injury function for people. It, you know, so in addition to measuring important post-discharge outcomes for people, it can also be a target um, and help identify people who might be vulnerable to poor outcomes and be able to use that to target um, either more aggressive resources given to somebody at the time of hospital discharge, you know, or supporting their community ambulation by um, providing more uh, community services and supports. So claims-based days at home in Medicare data is you know, being evaluated as a quality measure by um, CMS, a National Quality Forum, uh, as well as other organizations and work from our collaborators um, here and at Yale suggests that it does measure unique domains of quality that are not captured by mortality and readmission rates alone. So it helps us understand both processes of care uh, that impact these important outcomes for patients, as well as um, gives us targets for future improvement. So when we calculate this, we can really simply just take all of the Medicare files that are available and we can use that to identify with pretty good uh, accuracy where somebody is on any given day, whether they're in a hospital, a nursing home, in long-term care. Um, we can also add in other files to understand if they're an emergency department or observation day. Um, and we can even use home healthcare files to capture whether or not these days are homebound. So even if they're at home, can we capture days that we know from Medicare statutory requirements that they're homebound? And we can look at the different profiles of recovery across poverty subgroups by looking at people who are duly eligible for Medicaid, which is almost exclusively for people who are living below the poverty line. And we can do that in the context of a traumatic hip fracture. Um, so that's one area of research is looking at geriatric trauma in our group. And what we found is um, we, be, we were able to look across seven years of data, um, created monthly counts of days at home before and after hip fractures to understand how people are spending their time and use some latent trajectory analysis techniques. So advanced techniques to understand you know, what was going on with patients beforehand and what was driving those differences, whether it was you know, comorbidities, or in our case, we wanted to see what social determinants of health were, were mapping onto high-risk groups. And we used regression models to predict post-fracture outcomes to see if they were helpful in looking at how people were going to do. And we actually limited this sample to patients with dementia because we 
found that these populations are particularly challenging because they have high healthcare needs and high variability. Um, so understanding how social determinants of health impacts uh, dementia was particularly important for this particular population. And we think the potential value of this information could be that Medicare could have this information readily available to hospitals um, to feed into electronic medical records. Hospitals can already pull how many days you've spent in a hospital or nursing home in the prior year um, as part of their eligibility checks for Medicare. And that data might have value in prognosticating outcomes as well. So what we found was there was three really distinct groups of people before their hip fracture. A, what we consider robust are people who spent most of their days at home and two other groups who uh, were differentiated based on you know, one that was declining pretty rapidly before their fracture and one that was um, improving, but still on average doing worse than, than the robust group. And one of the biggest differentiators between these groups was the percentage that were dual eligible for Medicaid. Um, nearly a 50% difference in relative proportions of people on Medicaid between the best, the most um, highly functioning groups, the ones that were doing the best before fracture and the ones that weren't doing as well. And that had significant implications. Membership in one of those pre-fracture trajectories was a strong and independent predictor of one year mortality. So there was 65% higher risk of one year mortality for, for survivors of hip fracture um, if they were in that declining group before the fracture versus in the, the more stable group. And that was after taking into account all their comorbidities, all their other demographic factors, geographic considerations, surgical considerations. Um, so it says that, you know, these resilient or, or um, you know, clinical subgroups, which we call kind of resilience phenotypes before a fracture are really driven by poverty and may have some influence on post-fracture recovery. And when we actually decided to see how poverty differentially impacted people with dementia as compared to those who didn't have it, we, we ran a, a different type of modeling strategy. Um, so we asked a separate question. If we took all the patients with hip fracture and we looked at those with dementia and then looked at the disparity that we knew already existed with dementia and compared it with and without poverty, would we see major interaction, major effect modification? And for people who lived above the poverty line, we could see in the six months before their fracture, they typically didn't have a whole lot of differences in the number of days they were spending at home. Um, but clearly at the time of index fracture, this kind of big dip in the graph here, and until one year later, there was significant reductions in the number of days spent at home for people with dementia, even if they lived above the poverty line. But for people below the poverty line, that gap was substantially wider to the point where we've actually framed it like this where we've said that people with dementia spend 44 more days in hospitals or nursing homes if they live above the poverty line as compared to people without dementia. But for those living below the poverty line, they spend 58 more days in a hospital or nursing home in the year following hip fracture. So we frame that as a poverty penalty. Like what is the cost of poverty in terms of aging in place among older adults with dementia? And we, we've calculated that in this case to be 14 fewer days at home, which is more than the minimally clinically important difference and certainly um, something that's clinically meaningful to patients and their caregivers in a high mortality condition like hip fracture. Having those extra days at home is certainly helpful, but poverty is certainly driving that and something we don't address well. So the mechanisms behind that are, are you know, unclear from Medicare data. We don't have that kind of detail. But from interviews that we're starting to do now, we're thinking that you know, access to needed supports like durable medical equipment, transportation barriers, and food insecurity are major drivers of, of this hypothesized mechanism and things we should be screening for as rehabilitation providers, these unmet needs, working with our social work partners and our geriatrician colleagues to try to bridge all of these gaps that are clearly impacting you know, high quality aging in place. And other mechanisms that affect it, you know, we have 
actual measured poverty, you know, means testing for, for Medicaid in many cases, we also have perceptions of poverty. Even perceiving that you don't have enough money to make ends meet every month was associated with elevated mortality after disabling hospitalizations. So work we've done in a, a sample of heart, heart attack survivors uh, that was published in JAMA Internal Medicine suggested that patients who don't have enough money to make ends meet just in their perceptions of, of their monthly uh, income, they had 65 to 70% higher mortality risk over a year following heart attack. And that was even after accounting for a, a array of covariates, including comorbidities and, and very detailed data on how uh, severe their heart attack was. So it says that financial situation is driving both the number of days people are spending at home um, and the quality of those days. One of the aspects that goes along really um, in hand in hand with poverty is neighborhoods. So people that are higher poverty tend to live in higher poverty neighborhoods. When you live in higher poverty neighborhoods, our preliminary work with other highly disabled populations, such as those recovering from critical illness, has suggested that living uh, in the most disadvantaged neighborhoods, the top 25th percent of poverty, was associated with a modest but consistent increase in disability um, for survivors of critical illness. That ended up being 10 to 15 percent higher disability burden over one year, um, which in for most patients was the difference between being independent or needing human assistance with at least one activity of daily living um, over the course of a year, which for those of us who are geriatric providers or rehabilitation providers, needing help with one more ADL from another person can be uh, the difference between independence and dependence at home um, in some tasks or, or escalating um, a need for care from a residential environment to assisted living or into a nursing home in some cases. So among the neighborhood factors that we have found is, is significantly driving some of these disparities is access to transportation. So this map of Baltimore shows you um, the percentage of people who rely on public transportation. And if I overlaid a map of poverty over this, it would almost be a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, but older adults that live in these high poverty neighborhoods often have to walk up to 500 meters to access transportation to get to the doctor or to the grocery store. Um, and even something as simple as more transit stops in that neighborhood was associated with better mobility for older adults in prior studies. Um, but many of our older adults in these neighborhoods live very far from a stop. Um, like we said, it's most common in these economically deprived neighborhoods to have low transit density. Um, and when we think about what we have as community goals for, for patients during rehabilitation from one of these disabling hospitalizations, walking 150 feet doesn't get them to any meaningful transportation stops. And thus, you know, we're still cre per, kind of perpetuating a homebound status for those patients. Um, that's disproportionately affecting those in the lowest income neighborhoods. We've seen that in other work that we've published in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, where broken and cracked sidewalks near your home, which is a hallmark of many disadvantaged neighborhoods with um, you know, having poorer quality infrastructure, was associated with less transit use. And this contributes to social isolation and loneliness among many older adult populations, which is something that our geriatrician colleagues and many other professionals are, are very interested in. Social isolation is really concerning because it drives poorer outcomes after these really disabling hospitalizations. So work that we did in JAMA Internal Medicine a couple of years ago with my colleagues, um, Lauren Ferrante and Andrew Cohen and, and others at Yale, suggested that the most socially isolated patients um, during the time of hospitalization had double the risk of death as compared to the least socially isolated patients when recovering from critical illness. So like a really severely disabling hospitalization. And disability risk also was higher with increasing social isolation. The gap between the pre-ICU and post-ICU disability counts 
substantially increased as social isolation increased, making it a 50% relative increase in disability between the, the least and most socially isolated patients, difference of one to two ADLs where human assistance was required. Again, very clinically important. The built environment quality and mobility is also something that we really have to think about. You know, that broken sidewalk concern is not, you know, isolated to just those using transit. People that live in areas with broken sidewalks have four and a half times the odds of mobility disability or the inability to walk two or three blocks as compared to those who live in more uh, well-kempt neighborhoods. This is really concerning because we never practice this with patients during rehabilitation settings. And the people that are most likely to be affected by this are those that are living in the most disadvantaged neighborhoods. Lack of continuous sidewalks also was a significant factor in falls. So there's a 27% increase in the odds of being a recurrent faller for um, people that, that live in those neighborhoods. And so that's obviously a high risk of injury and you know, ending up back in a cycle of disability if you have a fall-related fracture. And those are more common outside. So when I walk to work every day, I see things like this, commonplace holes in the ground that a cane or a walker would get stuck in and present massive fall risk for, for patients in these urban areas. And, you know, alongside of that, both this transit access and built environment quality issues lead to issues with accessing high quality health care. When you live in a high poverty zip code, you're more likely to receive care from lower quality skilled nursing facilities and you know, home health care agencies that are less able to keep you out of the hospital. I'll work with my colleague at uh, NYU, Jasmine Travers, who's another Beeson scholar funded by the Donahue Foundation. We found that staffing in nursing homes located in these disadvantaged areas was significantly lower um, across nurses and rehabilitation professionals. And this disparity is associated with things like higher rates of antipsychotic prescribing and worse, um, worse outcomes with things like pressure ulcers and ADL improvements in the nursing home. So low, low numbers of staffing is, a, is one metric of the quality of nursing home care, which is much lower in these disadvantaged areas. So living in poverty has a penalty in terms of accessing high quality health care in many circumstances. And it's also not experienced equally across racial and ethnic identity groups. So poverty is much more likely to be experienced by Black, Hispanic and other minoritized populations. And this is for structural reasons, federal and state level policies that have kind of perpetuated a wealth gap. Um, but we found specifically that black TBI survivors, another high disability group in work that we published in JAMA Surgery, uh, received 40% fewer outpatient visits after a TBI compared to their, their white peers. Um, and that was persistent across all six months of follow-up. That was very concerning because we've also seen significant racial disparities that were work, uh, a paper that we're working on now in the number of days people are spending at home that may in part be a result of these unmet rehabilitation needs. And we can't ignore gun violence in our communities. We're doing qualitative work now that suggested that one of the reasons people aren't going out and, and able to participate in community activities is gun violence that's limiting community mobility. These are some quotes from our participants in our study. It's just this atmosphere of Baltimore. I'm scared a bullet don't have no name on it. If I go outside, I'm afraid I'm gonna get shot at. I don't wanna be a target. I don't feel like ducking bullets outside. These are all older adults with a recent surgery or hospitalization living in disadvantaged, um, economically disadvantaged communities. And these are barriers to physical activity that no amount of strengthening or range of motion exercises are going to address. So how do we move towards mobility equity? We have to think about both of our, you know, acute and rehabilitation settings and thinking about how do we work on outside ambulation for older adults, things like 
accessing bus stops and getting on public transportation um, and moving that stuff into the home healthcare setting and really trying to address um, work around this homebound requirement and try to meet the demands of what they would need to actually get to outpatient care, which is the goal of home care is to get you to be able to participate in outpatient care. And too many patients fall through those cracks. And outpatient care, when they're being seen by mul you know, multiple patients at a time by a therapist, it doesn't allow this optimal care to get somebody outside and practice transit with them or practice walking on uneven ground with an assistive device. Um, and then there's clearly other policy level targets that we would need to include along with individual therapy type of interventions, you know, shoring up safety net supports, micro-targeting geo, you know, deprived geographic areas, which might include increasing reimbursement for treating patients in those areas, which might include targeted, um, you know, research investment or, or infrastructure investment in improving neighborhood green space and giving safe places for people to go outside and walk or having, um, you know, community supported programs that are, you know, peer, peer buddy walking programs or something that would make people feel safer. Um, and then DME policy, um, which only allows you to prescribe devices right now based on home needs, um, and you're not allowed to prescribe based on community needs. And that could change and easily improve mobility for older adults. So I know I'm kind of towards the end of you know, this piece here, but and I know I went through that fast, but I do want to highlight a couple of key points. Both neighborhood and individual level poverty drive poorer outcomes after disabling hospitalization. It's intersectional with geriatric vulnerabilities like dementia. And it's something that we rarely address um, in contemporary rehabilitation. The fact that people living in poverty are gonna have elevated mobility needs. You know, we need to practice this walking on broken sidewalks and walking several blocks outside, um, but our current rehabilitation structure doesn't allow for that. So people fall through the cracks and it disproportionately affects people living in poverty. Um, and that's contributed to additionally by structural policy barriers, you know, both historical and current. Um, so thinking about interventions, we have to address these functional impairments. High level gait and balance interventions are critical but we need to pair those with address, addressing contextual factors to be maximally effective. So I know we went long here and I'm gonna open this for questions after, but I wanna kind of open the door for Dr. Brock to kind of talk about how this presentation intersects with some of the, the ClinStar priorities and really ties together several disciplines. Great, thanks, Jason. And let me just make sure I can. Okay, so um, I'm here today to talk to you about a great program called ClinStar. Um, I'm representing ClinStar as a member of the uh, leadership core, but I also want to um, recognize um, Andrea Sherman and o I think Odette is still on the call as well, um, who are part of ClinStar as well. Um, what is ClinStar? It's a national platform which is really targeting early stage investigators. Um, the mission is to really convey scientific and research knowledge, foster networking and collaboration, provide mentoring and career development support, and really to advance transdisciplinary research. Oops, and my slides are not advancing. Let's see, there we go. Um, so this slide just highlights some of the uh, ClinStar rehabilitation and aging uh, clinician researchers who um, have taken advantage of many of the great things ClinStar has to offer. Um, you've heard Jason speak today, and Jason is um, one of the recipients of a ClinStar mini sabbatical in 2022, um, where he was able to travel to um, Wisconsin and, and work on some of his research. Um, Jennifer Vincenzo is another um, recipient of a mini sabbatical for the year 2023. Um, and then others on here, we have um, uh, Becca LaSalle who received pilot funding 
um, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And uh, Mariana Wingood, who received um, a travel award so that it helped finance her travel to the annual meeting. And then lastly, um, Jacqueline Palmer, who um, was able to get some funding for the early career lecture um, component. So Clinster has a lot of great initiatives um, that I think everybody should take advantage of. Um, the first is a research database of transdisciplinary clinician scientists. And in a few slides, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, there's also a pilot grant project or a program where you can apply for, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's up to $50,000 in funding. Um, and this is a really great pro uh, program in that if you're an early stage investigator as defined by NIH, um, you, can, you, you have to be an early stage investigator to apply for this. So it really limits who can apply um, for this funding and makes your um, chances that much better. Um, there are opportunities for short-term mentoring and advising. Um, gonna talk some more on the next slide about outreach funds. There's journey stories where they highlight um, different career trajectories of individuals in aging research. Um, and you can find those on their website. There are also several special interest groups where individuals who share um, a common research area will get together and meet and, and discuss and potentially put in symposium for conferences and maybe even um, work on manuscripts. Um, we have a new one that's getting started I think Wednesday this week, which would be um, kind of pertinent to this group. It's an ex exercise in lifestyle medicine um, special interest group, which I think is going to be really great. Um, the ClinStar off also offers mentoring office hours. And these mentoring office hours are a chance for you to meet with some of the giants in the field of aging. Um, they're, they're held, held, I think, about monthly. You can find the, the, the more detail on the website about it. But what you do is you go in and you sign up for a time slot, and you then get to meet with, with one of these, um, as I said, giants in the field one-on-one -on -one and discuss different um, topics with them, whether it's something about career development or about research. It's really a great opportunity um, to meet and, and, and to speak with individuals in the field. Um, ClinStar also holds regular webinars um, in that not only that you can attend um, live, but you could, they also record them and they're, they're on their website. If I'm not mistaken, there is a webinar that they are co-sponsoring with the Pepper Centers um, this Friday on promotion. So for anybody who will be going up for promotion in the near future, this could be a great webinar for you. And then um, they also host an annual meeting and I will tell you this year the annual meeting for the first time was in person and it was in San Diego in November and I attended it and it was fabulous. Um, to me the best thing about the annual meeting there was great scientific co content but it was a fabulous networking opportunity. Um, they really put a lot of effort into designing the, the annual meeting so you have time to meet and talk to and really get to know the others at the conference. Um, and then there are tons of funding and research and career development resources that you can find on the website. And then there's this whole new um, diversity, equity, inclusion and accessibility initiatives. Um, and one of those, if I'm not mistaken, I think the next mentoring office hours is going to be around that topic with uh, and and the mentor that's going to be hosting that is Roland Thorpe um, from Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University. So please check that out. So some of the um, outreach funds that are available, um, there are these mini sabbatical awards which provides um, funding for short short term immersive learning experiences, and th this funding is up to four thousand dollars. And this is what Jason took advantage of in order to further his work in health disparities um, by traveling to the University of Wisconsin um, and to train at the Center for Health Disparities Research there. 
Um, as I said, um, Jennifer Vincenzo, also another physical therapist, is got a, a mini sabbatical for this year to travel to Oregon to look at um, how to implement the study for fall prevention in outpatient PT clinics. Other funds that are available, there's the Visiting Professor Travel Fund. This would be if you identify um, someone that you would like to bring to your institution to either you know, provide a grand rounds or to interact with individuals in your, in your research lab, um, you can apply for this Visiting Professor Travel Fund, which would provide $3,000 to bring this person to your facility. Um, there's also a distinguished professorship. Um, this is where you can invite an aging researcher to speak at a specialty or subspecialty conference. Um, and a great example is, you know, if you want to bring a researcher, an aging researcher to the um, ACRM in 2023, you could actually use this funding to support that person to come to the, com to the annual conference. And then lastly, there's the Early Career Lecture Fund, and this provides um, travel funds for an early career clinician scientist to present aging related research at an annual scientific meeting or, or medical specialty association meeting where aging research is not the primary focus. Um, so here an example was the um, Dr. Palmer presented aerobic exercise effects on brain function and neuroplasticity across the lifespan and disease at the American Society of Neurorehabilitation. So really a great way to um, get some funding to be able to travel to another conference that doesn't necessarily have an aging focus. Um, and last but not least, um, we have the ClinStart database. Um, want to say first, First and foremost, this is free, completely free, no charge. Um, you can go in and you can create a profile for yourself. Um, and you can also go in and search the different pro profiles, um, browse information on researchers, publications, funded grants. It's a great way if you're trying to um, find new collaborators, especially if you're at a smaller university or smaller facility that doesn't have a lot of um, aging researchers that you can connect with, maybe you can use this ClinStar database to, to reach out to people. And what's really nice about this is that many of these individuals have already um, agreed or are designated as wanting to be involved or wanting to be mentors. So they've, you know, your, your chances of getting them to respond to you are gonna be much better because these people are already invested in mentoring the next generation. And I think, and last but not least, um, here are all the important links. Um, you know, the website, um, you can, or just Google ClinStar and it'll pop up. Um, there's buttons there that you can join the listserv so you get all this great information. Um, there's a tab at the top of the webpage to go to the database that you can then start to create a profile. You can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn. And last but not least, if you want to talk to a person, um, you can always email Andrea at the bottom, um, who's on the call today as well. I know th I went through that really quickly, but I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions if we, if anybody has any. All right, so thank you for the talk. Um, do we have any anyone who would like to ask questions? If, if no one, I, I have a question for Jason. And I, Jason, I don't know if, if I missed this. I was really interested in that um, that 14 fewer days at home for the individuals, I think, with dementia and below the poverty line. Um, 14 fewer days in what time period? Is that Was that in a year, a, a month? No, it was a year. So a year, OK. Was, yeah, so it was dementia-related disparities for people above the poverty line were 44 days. So if you have dementia and above the poverty line, you spent 44 fewer days. But if you were below the poverty line, you spent 58 fewer days at home. So yeah. that interaction. Which is really, yeah. yeah, it's really impressive because that's, you know, at least a day a month, you know, if you want to put it over a year. It's a good mm -hmm. bit of time. 
Yeah, and so there's been some very preliminary work from other Beeson scholars. I feel like it's all over the place. So Dave Kim at, at, up in Boston at, at, at Hebrew Life has done a lot of work validating days at home against function and quality of life. And, you know, this 14 to 17 days per year is, you know, clinically meaningful for like, and, you know, you know, additional decline in functional status or predictive mortality. So, um, and smaller numbers have been seen for other populations. So I would say this is a clinically meaningful difference as well as, you know, I think I would argue like from a patient standpoint, like if you said you're gonna spend two more weeks in a nursing home, I think most patients would be like, that's terrible. Yeah, well, and you think of the cost associated with it, because if they're not at home, they're right, they're likely in a nursing home or a hospital or some type of facility, which the costs mm -hmm. are, are gonna be greater. Yeah, and it just depends on who's paying the cost. Medicare, you know, might pick it up until they go to long stay nursing homes and then Medicaid is picking it up. So sometimes it's fragmented across and it's hard to actually see the totality of where people are spending time because, you know, Medicare is only covering certain pieces of that. So, Jason, thank you very much, Jason and uh, Dr. Brock for a wonderful presentation. This is Amit. So, Jason, I have two questions for you. One, like, you know, when, how did you calculate, when you said like, you know, calculating number of days in home, and then like, you know, if someone is on Medicaid, like, you know, or like, you know, on, um, for example, Medicare Advantage plan, and they have, a, as you said, like, you know, fragmented payment system. Some of them are covered, some of their services are covered by PACE, for example, and dual SNF plan for the HMO enrollees. How yeah. do you compute them? Like, you know, this, because some of the data are missing, again, because of the fragmented piece of the data also. Yeah, that's a good question. So these are Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries. We don't mm -hmm. have the Medicare Advantage files yet, though, you know, stay tuned. I'll be knocking on your door for them at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but what we do have is we have a pretty good way for Medicare fee-for-service to capture, you know, any Medicare paid claim. And then nursing home stays, regardless of payer, would be included in the MDS, so which is a yes. nursing home yeah. investment file. So we're mm -hmm. able to capture additionally, you know, stays that might have been paid by the Veterans Administration or Medicaid or um, or other payers mm -hmm. um, that would capture the long stay in nursing home. So there's clearly days that were missing, um, you know, mm -hmm. that that people might not have had recorded. You know, we're we're at the whim of you know Medicare claims and how accurate they are, but. The patterns that we saw follow what we would expect in terms of functional recovery. So we, we felt like we were at least getting a good snapshot of, of the experiences yeah. people had and the disparities. Okay. And the second question is like, are you thinking like, and of course in Alzheimer's and patient with ADRD, it's, you saw that, but like, you know, is there is any other condition like stroke or you know, TVI are you thinking to replicate the study? Um, so we've already replicated it in TDI. We have the exact, almost the exact same pattern. So that's already in review right now. Um, we're doing a study with heart failure, um, to kind of a lower, you know, less catastrophic disability, but you know, more common condition to kind of think about what we need to do from, you know, a home healthcare side to support these patients. And we're seeing very similar patterns, just lower magnitude. And, I have a surgical re resident studying diverticulitis surgery among older adults and same pattern there too. So um, okay. I think there's something to be said for dementia is bad after you know these major disabling hospitalizations, but poverty makes it multiplicatively yeah. worse. And yeah. you know, a lot of that comes into you know unmet needs for aging in place, in our opinion, mm -hmm. because these patients weren't that much sicker beforehand. They were spending almost the same number of days at home before a surgery. So it's really, uh, you know, we're not bridging those acute needs quickly enough. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. Hey, do we have any more questions? I have a question for Dr. Brock. 
about uh, Clean Star? Yes. So um, I was interested with the uh, the ones with the grant and the, the money. Uh, is it also good for international or like no only in the state? I, I will let Andrea speak to this, yeah. but I'm almost positive you have to be in, 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 in the United States citizen, correct? Yes, you, you need to be a U.S. citizen and also working in a U.S. Um, institution, U.S. based institution. Wow. So. That would be my motivation to go. To <laughs> <laughs> OK, this All is right. the reason then you have to do a PhD in the U.S. Come <laughs> over here. <laughs> And Dr. Brock will fund you. She has a lot of funding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any more questions? We have one. Uh, actually, we have a minute left before we can finish the webinar. This is actually a good webinar. Yeah, I, I would just second that, you know, it's not just about the, the funding available through ClinStore. There's a lot of great resources that you could take advantage of. Um, no matter what your status is. Oh. Yeah, the mentorship, I've been able to go to like the office hours when they first opened and, and met with uh, somebody from University of California, San Francisco. It probably would have taken me a month and a half to get on their calendar had I emailed them cold. So being able to, to find time to meet with, with expert researchers who have had experience and ask questions about funding my lab and who, you know, hiring support staff and, you know, PhD students versus postdocs at what point in your career, like, you know, a lot of, a lot of that really requires some historical knowledge and, you know, some, some deep understanding of mentoring across, you know, trainees um, across a lifetime. And it's hard to replicate that kind of access to these clinicians. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, just to dovetail on um, Jen and Jason, there, there are a number of opportunities and you should uh, feel free to join our database because we do have international um, researchers on that and certainly our webinars and other programming is open to um, non-US residents. Okay, I will definitely, and I, um, I will definitely advertise in my yeah. school for, <laughs> for collaboration. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And Noemi, maybe you could, I don't, I'm not sure if the recording of this um, webinar could be shared with the group, the um, aging interest group.